Hello, I'm Dave Brown for Teletrain. Today's program deals with the physical hazards of chemicals. How chemicals can start fires, cause explosions, or make a fire worse once it has started. The fact is, we're around these hazards nearly all of our lives, at work and at home. But the problem is that often we don't recognize a hazard because we just don't know enough about the properties of chemicals or about how fires can get started. On this program, we're going to tell you some things that may surprise you. Many of you may be familiar with this. It's called a fire triangle and is usually pictured this way to demonstrate that fuel, oxygen, and a heat source are the three things necessary for a fire to burn. Take away any one of these three and you won't have a fire. Now this diagram can usually provide a good enough explanation. But when we're talking about chemicals, we have to be a bit more precise. On labels and material safety data sheets, fuel, the substance that will burn, is often referred to as a combustible or flammable. Now it's true that just about anything will burn under the right conditions. But the terms flammables and combustibles refer to those substances most likely to burn under normal conditions. In most situations, flammables are more hazardous than combustibles. But I wouldn't get either one close to an oxidizer or an ignition source. Now, why did we change the word oxygen to oxidizer on our triangle? As a gas, oxygen makes up 21% of our atmosphere and supports the vast majority of fires that take place. But there are other chemicals such as chlorine, iodine, bromine, and fluorine that will also support combustion. And there are thousands of compounds like nitric acid and potassium chlorate that will give off oxygen. Any chemical that acts like oxygen or gives off oxygen is called an oxidizer. The first thing to know about them is that they should be kept away from heat and fuels. The second thing is that some of them can be very unstable. If you find a four in the reactivity section and an oxy in the information section of an NFPA label, you probably have a peroxide, and that means an extremely sensitive chemical. Most peroxides and peroxide formers contain other chemicals called inhibitors to make them more stable. But if these stop working, friction from unscrewing the cap or picking up the container can provide enough heat to trigger an explosion. An even more hazardous situation can occur when compounds, some of them fuels, can form peroxides easily. Ethers, acetals, styrenes, and vinyl compounds are some examples. If a material safety data sheet indicates that a substance can form peroxides, or if a substance is a peroxide, treat it carefully. If you notice anything unusual about it or its container, don't touch it. Inform your supervisor. To have a fire, you also have to have heat. You can probably name a lot of heat sources, matches, pilot lights, and welding torches, cigarettes, and hot plates. They're obvious. But if you think of this leg of our triangle as ignition sources, you won't forget some that are not so obvious. Around flammable substances, the heat of a light bulb could cause ignition. So can friction of moving parts or the heat from an air compressor. In a highly flammable or explosive atmosphere, use only approved low heat sealed portable lights and cords. Sparks from static electricity can prove disastrous. When you're transferring flammable or combustible liquids from one metal container to another, make sure that one of the containers is grounded, and then make sure that the containers maintain metal-to-metal -metal contact. The safest way to do this is with a bonding wire. Chemical reactions make up only a small percentage of fire causes but they can be a special problem because they can often supply two or even all three fire ingredients. Pyrophoric chemicals or pyrophores spontaneously ignite, that is, catch fire by themselves. They react so fast to the oxygen in the air that they generate their own heat. Some have so much energy they'll react with almost anything. 
When you see words like rapidly decomposes, polymerizes, or condenses on a material safety data sheet, you'll know that the chemicals can give off enough heat to start their own fires or keep them going once they've started. Some chemicals react violently with water to produce heat and sometimes fuel. Calcium carbide, for example, is not flammable, but on contact with water produces acetylene gas. And watch what happens when a water reactive chemical like sodium contacts water. Two men were recently killed when they used water to clean a tank that had held sodium. Allow water reactives to warm to room temperature before you open them. If the container is cooler than the air around it, moisture from the air can condense on the surface of the open container and cause a violent reaction. Store water reactives away from sprinkler systems or where water would be used if the materials caught fire. The MSDS will list any special handling or storage requirement. All right, now that you understand some of the hazards of oxidizers and ignition sources, let's take a closer look at flammables and combustibles. We're going to start with a simple demonstration, but before we do, I want to warn you. Some of the demonstrations you see on this program are hazardous. We're doing them under very controlled conditions. Under no circumstances should you try any of them yourself. Now watch. Steel can be ignited with an ordinary match. Why is the steel wool burning? Because the thinness of the fibers is allowing a great deal of oxygen to come in contact with the steel. The more finely divided a substance is, the easier it is to ignite. Wood chips will catch on fire much more easily than a log. The same principle applies with aerosol mists. The surface area of the material is increased when the liquid is broken up into tiny drops. Even if the substance in a can is non-flammable, the propellant in a can might be. Be careful where you use these. Now, when you are working with flammable or combustible liquids, there are a few things you'll need to understand. Liquids don't actually burn. They have to become a vapor first which means they must change from a liquid to a gas. Some vaporize at room temperature. Others have to be heated to cause vapors to form. When you find the flash point listed on an MSDS, it refers to the temperature at which a liquid, and in some cases a solid, will produce enough vapor to catch on fire when a flame or spark is passed above it. Let's see what flash point really means. It can be very important. We'll pass this lighted match over a container of methanol, that's wood alcohol, a flammable. With a flash point of 52 degrees Fahrenheit, its vapors easily ignite. But when we pass a match over this container of acetic acid with a flash point of 106 degrees Fahrenheit, a combustible, nothing. Let's heat it up just a bit. Now let's try again. Magic? No. When we heat the substance to its flash point temperature, it forms enough vapors to ignite. The point is, combustible liquids can become flammable if enough heat is present to increase the amount of vapor formed. So be careful not to let them heat up. Kerosene or even safety solvents put down on a hot surface can become flammable. Increasing the surface area of a liquid also increases the amount of vapor formed. Even relatively high flash point liquids can be more flammable than you think if you have a large surface area. Ventilation can help keep large vapor areas from forming. Observe no smoking signs. Keep as few flammables in your work area as you can get by with and use safety cans like this one with a flame arrester in the spout and a vented cap. Remember, flammable liquids form vapors easily and these vapors, when confined, apply pressure to the container walls. If no relief is provided, the container could explode. 
Now, here's another way that a combustible liquid can become a dangerous flammable. When we drop a match into this kerosene, as you can see, it does not burn. This gasoline with a lower flash point burns easily. Now, let's add a little gasoline to the kerosene and watch. The flash point of the mixture becomes much lower than you might expect. When even a small amount of a flammable substance is added to the kerosene, it becomes much more hazardous. You'll also see the terms upper and lower flammable limits, UFL and LFL, on a material safety data sheet. Sometimes they'll be called upper and lower explosive limits, or UEL and LEL. They can best be explained with a demonstration of fuel-air mixture in an internal combustion engine. If you know about engines, you know that even gasoline, which is very flammable, has to be mixed with the right amount of air to burn in the cylinder. That's what carburetors do. If not enough fuel vapor is present to burn, we say that the air-fuel mixture is too lean. Watch what happens as the fuel is cut back. When not enough fuel vapor is present, one of the main fire ingredients is missing, so the engine won't run. We've reached the lower flammable limit. This time, let's add more fuel vapors. Now we're getting too much fuel in the mixture. It's getting too rich, and pretty soon, we'll flood out. Now we've reached the upper flammable limit. There's too much fuel vapor and not enough air. One of the ingredients, oxygen, is inadequate. What does all this mean? It takes the right combination of fuel and air to burn. The distance between upper and lower flammable limits is called the flammability range. A word of caution. Be aware that any major increase in temperature, pressure, or oxygen content will widen the flammability range. The wider the range, the more hazardous the substance. Vapors which are considered to be non-flammable can be ignited if the heat source is strong enough. Besides flash point and flammability range, the auto-ignition temperature of a substance also determines how much of a fire hazard it may be. It is the temperature at which a substance will catch fire from heat alone, without a spark or flame. Be careful especially with combustibles or flammables around high heat sources, like a steam line or a piece of metal that has just been welded. They could burst into flame. Remember, the lower the flash point, the wider the flammability range. The lower the ignition temperature of a substance, the more hazardous it is. Because most flammable gases and vapors cannot be seen, they have some special hazards. Let's look at a few things you need to be aware of. Those gases and vapors which are heavier than air act a lot like liquids. If you pour water from a bucket, it forms a puddle at your feet and runs downhill. You can see it clearly with this carbon dioxide which flows downhill just as most flammable vapors would. If you had a bucket full of these flammable vapors and poured them out, they'd do the same thing, stay close to the ground and run downhill. This is where flashback comes in. You know the bucket's empty. You poured out all the vapors, right? Not quite. No more than you poured out all the water. Just like powder leading to a fuse, the vapors leave a trail from where they flowed downhill, back to where you are holding the bucket. If someone down there lights a torch or a cigarette and ignites the vapors, the fire will travel all the way back to the bucket or source, even as far as 300 feet. A similar thing can happen if vapors have soaked into your clothes. Even if you're away from the liquid itself, you won't be away from its vapors. Light a match and you're in trouble. Flammable vapors will usually be found in low-lying areas blocking out air. Check any confined or low-lying area before entering it. You'll not only have a fire hazard, you're likely to lose consciousness from lack of oxygen. Make sure that any test equipment you're using has been checked for accuracy. 
a false reading could prove deadly. Containers of flammable materials are never really empty, not until they've been purged or flushed to remove the vapors. This includes tank cars, large storage tanks, gas cylinders, any size or shape of container. Piling a so-called empty container of a corrosive on top of another so-called empty container of a flammable is asking for trouble. So far I've used the word explosion to mean a very rapidly burning fire, a reaction that takes place in thousands or millions of a second. But an explosion can be a sudden release of pressure without fire. Even non-flammable gases in small containers can be a hazard. People have been killed or badly injured from a can such as this one. Treat anything under pressure carefully and hold or position it such that your body will not be in the way should pressure suddenly be released. You welders know to stand aside when you crack a valve. If the compressed gas is flammable, you've got yourself an explosion as well as fire hazard. Avoid rough treatment, dropping, high heat conditions, or improper use, such as the wrong regulator or damaged pressure gauge. Think of every compressed gas cylinder as a potential bomb. Use a hand truck to move them and clamp them securely. One thing that's really important about handling compressed gases, when they're released, they're cold, freezing cold, and can cause serious burns to eyes and skin. This burn was caused by vapors from a tank of propane. If you work with oxygen, you also know that contact with any grease or oil, no matter how small the amount, even grease on clothes or hands, can cause an explosion. Now, if a fire does get started, there are a few rules to remember. First, whenever there is the slightest doubt that you can quickly put out a fire by yourself, make sure that someone sounds an alarm or notifies the fire department immediately. Seconds count. Many serious fires have resulted because someone mistakenly thought he could handle the situation alone. And second, if you have to use a fire extinguisher, make sure you use the correct extinguisher. Using the wrong kind can actually make the fire worse. If you try water on flammable liquids, you'll spread them out rather than put them out, like this. Make sure you use a Class B extinguisher for flammable liquids. And remember what happens when water contacts a combustible metal like sodium or potassium? Most highly reactive metals require Class D extinguishers. If you have any doubts about firefighting procedures around a chemical you work with, consult the MSDS before trouble occurs. Oxygen, heat, fuel. While all three ingredients are necessary to have a fire, keep in mind that a strong ingredient in one leg of the triangle can make up for a weak one in another. A strong oxidizer, such as oxygen, can increase the chances of fire even if the fuel is not one of the most flammable. A low flash point fuel won't need much heat energy or oxygen. A non-flammable vapor can burn if the heat source provides enough energy. Whenever these ingredients come together in a dangerous combination, that's when fires start. So anytime you work with or are around any of these physical hazards, and you're around the most of your life, realize that you can control many situations by just being aware of potential dangers and stopping them before they have a chance to start. If they do start, know how to respond including how and when to get out, and how and when to call in the pros. I'm Dave Brown for Teletrain.